The Battle of Cambrai was a British attack in the First World War, followed by the biggest German counterattack against the British Expeditionary Force since 1914. The town of Cambrai, in the département of Nord, was an important supply centre for the German Siegfried Stellung and capture of the town and the nearby Borlen Ridge would threaten the rear of the German line to the north. Major General Henry Tudor, Commander, Royal Artillery of the 9th Division, advocated the use of new artillery infantry tactics on his sector of the front. During preparations, J. F. C. Fuller, a staff officer with the tank corps, looked for places to use tanks for raids. General Julian Bing, commander of the Third Army, decided to combine both plans. The French and British armies had used tanks in mass earlier in 1917, although to considerably less effect. After a big British success on the first day, mechanical unreliability, German artillery and infantry defences exposed the frailties of the Mark IV tank. On the second day, only about half of the tanks were operational and British progress was limited. In the history of the Great War, the British official historian, Wilfred Miles and modern scholars do not place exclusive credit for the first day on tanks but discuss the concurrent evolution of artillery, infantry and tank methods. Numerous developments since 1915 matured at Cambrai, such as predicted artillery fire, sound ranging, infantry infiltration tactics, infantry tank coordination and close air support. The techniques of industrial warfare continued to develop and played a vital part during the Hundred Days Offensive in 1918, along with replacement of the Mark IV tank with improved types. The rapid reinforcement and defense of Ball and Ridge by the Germans, as well as their counter-attack, were also notable achievements, which gave the Germans hope that an offensive strategy could end the war before American mobilization became overwhelming. Chapter 1 Prelude Chapter 1 Section 1 British Plan Proposals for an operation in the Cambrai area using a large number of tanks originated from Brigadier Huell of the Tank Corps, and the reliance on the secret transfer of artillery reinforcements to be silently registered to gain surprise came from Henry Hugh Tudor, commander of the 9th Infantry Division Artillery. In August 1917, Tudor conceived the idea of a surprise attack in the 4th Corps sector, he suggested a primarily artillery infantry attack, which would be supported by a small number of tanks, to secure a breakthrough of the German Hindenburg line. The German defences were formidable, Cambrai having been a quiet stretch of front thus far enabled the Germans to fortify their lines in depth and the British were aware of this. Tudor's plan sought to test new methods in combined arms, with emphasis on combined artillery and infantry techniques and see how effective they were against strong German fortifications. Tudor advocated using the new sound ranging and silent registration of guns to achieve instant suppression fire and surprise. He also wanted to use tanks to clear paths, through the deep, barbed wire obstacles in front of German positions, while supporting the tank force with the number 106 fuse, designed to explode high explosive ammunition without cratering the ground to supplement the armor. Chapter 1 Section 2 Air Support Two weeks before the start of the battle, the Royal Flying Corps began to train its pilots in ground attack tactics. Before the ground offensive, the RFC was assigned sets of targets to attack, including trenches, supply points and enemy airfields. Chapter 2 – Battle Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Third Army The battle began at dawn, approximately 6.30 on 20 November, with a predicted bombardment by 1,003 guns on German defences, followed by smoke and a creeping barrage at 300 yards ahead to cover the first advances. Despite efforts to preserve secrecy, the Germans had received sufficient intelligence to be on moderate alert, an attack on Havren Court was anticipated, as was the use of tanks. The attacking force was six infantry divisions of the 3rd Corps on the right and four corps on the left, supported by nine battalions of the Tank Corps with about 437 tanks. In reserve was one infantry division in four corps, and the three divisions of the Cavalry Corps. Initially, there was considerable success in most areas and it seemed as if a great victory was within reach, 
the Hindenburg Line had been penetrated with advances of up to 5.0 miles. On the right, the 12th Division advanced as far as Lato would before being ordered to dig in. The 20th Division forced a way through La Vacari, and then advanced to capture a bridge across the Canal de Son Contan at Masnias. The bridge collapsed under the weight of a tank halting the hopes for an advance across the canal. In the center the 6th Division captured Ribacourt and Marcoing but when the cavalry passed through late, they were repulsed from Noyelle. On the 4th Corps front, the 51st Division was held at Flesquieres, its first objective, which left the attacking divisions on each flank exposed to enfilade fire. Harper had used a local variation of the tank drill instead of the standard one laid down by the tank corps. Fresquieres was one of the most fortified points in the German line and was flanked by other strong points. Its defenders under Major Krebs acquitted themselves well against the tanks, almost 40 being knocked out by the artillery in the vicinity. The common explanation of the mythical German officer ignored the fact that the British tanks were opposed by a specialist anti-tank unit benefiting from the experience against French tanks in the Neville Offensive. The Germans abandoned Flesquieres during the night. To the west of Flesquieres, the 62nd Division swept all the way through Havrincourt and Graincourt to within reach of the woods on Borland Ridge and on the British left, the 36th Division reached the Bapaume Cambrai Road. Of the tanks, 180 were out of action after the first day, although only 65 had been destroyed. Of the other casualties, 71 had suffered mechanical failure and 43 had ditched. The British lost circa 4,000 casualties and took 4,200 prisoners, a casualty rate half that of the Third Battle of Ypres and a greater advance in six hours than in three months at Flanders but the British had failed to reach Borland Ridge. The German command was quick to send reinforcements and was relieved that the British did not manage fully to exploit their early gains. When the battle was renewed on the 21st of November, the pace of the British advance was greatly slowed. Fesquieres, that had been abandoned and canting were captured in the very early morning but in general the British took to consolidating their gains rather than expanding. The attacks by three corps were terminated and attention was turned to four corps. The effort was aimed at Ballen Ridge. Fighting was fierce around Ballen and at Anu was costly. German counterattacks squeezed the British out of movers on the 21st of November and Fontaine on the 22nd of November, when Anu was taken, the 62nd Division found themselves unable to enter Borlan Wood. The British were left exposed in a salient. Haig still wanted Borlan Ridge, and the exhausted 62nd Division was replaced by the 40th Division on the 23rd of November. Supported by almost 100 tanks and 430 guns, the 40th Division attacked into the woods of Borland Ridge on the morning of 23 November and made little progress. The Germans had put two divisions of Gruppe Arras on the ridge with another two in reserve and Gruppe Cordry was reinforced, the 40th Division attack reached the crest of the ridge but were held there and suffered more than 4,000 casualties in three days. More British troops were pushed in to move beyond the woods but the British reserves were rapidly depleted and more German reinforcements were arriving. The final British effort was on 27 November by the 62nd Division aided by 30 tanks. Early success was soon reversed by a German counter-attack. The British now held a salient roughly 6.8 miles times 5.9 miles with its front along the crest of the ridge. On 28 November, the offensive was stopped and the British troops were ordered to lay wire and dig in. The Germans were quick to concentrate their artillery on the new British positions. On 28 November, more than 16,000 shells were fired into the wood. Chapter 2 Section 2 – German Second Army As the British took the ridge, German reinforcements began to arrive. By the 23rd of November, the German command felt that a British breakthrough had been prevented and began to consider a counterstroke and 20 divisions were assembled in the Cambrai area. The Germans planned to retake the Borland salient and also to attack around Havrincourt, with diversionary attacks to hold four corps, 
it was hoped to at least reach the old positions on the Hindenburg line. The Germans intended to employ the new tactics of a short, intense period of shelling followed by a rapid assault using Houthia infiltration tactics, leading elements attacking in groups rather than waves and bypassing strong opposition. Three divisions of Gruppe Arras were to conduct the initial assault at Borlem. On the eastern flank of the British salient, Gruppe Cordry was to attack from Bantazel to Rumilly to capture Marcoing. Gruppe Bisigny advanced from Bantu. The two Gruppen had seven infantry divisions. British Seven Corps, to the south of the threatened area, warned three corps of German preparations. The German attack began at 7 a.m. on 30 November, almost immediately, the majority of three corps divisions were heavily engaged. The German infantry advance in the south was unexpectedly swift. The commanders of the 12th Division and 29th Division were almost captured, with Brigadier General Bertley Vincent having to fight his way out of his headquarters and grab men from retreating units to try to halt the Germans. In the south, the German advance spread across 8.1 miles and came within a few miles of the village of Metz and its link to Borlen. At Borlen the Germans suffered many casualties. British units displayed reckless determination, one group of eight British machine guns fired over 70,000 rounds against the German advance. The concentration of British effort to hold the ridge was effective but allowed the German advance elsewhere greater opportunity. Only counter-attacks by the Guards Division, the arrival of British tanks and the fall of night allowed the line to be held. By the following day, the impetus of the German advance was lost but pressure on 3 December led to the German capture of La Vacary and a British withdrawal on the east bank of the St. Quentin Canal. The Germans had reached a line curving from Quentin Ridge to near Marcoing. The German capture of Bonavis Ridge made the British hold on ball and precarious. On 3 December, Haig ordered a partial retreat from the North Salient and by 7 December, the British gains were abandoned except for a portion of the Hindenburg line around Havrincourt, Ribercourt, and Flesquieres. The Germans had exchanged this territorial loss for a slightly smaller sector to the south of Welsh Ridge. Chapter 3 Aftermath Chapter 3 Section 1 Analysis The first day of success was greeted in Britain by the ringing of church bells. The massed use of tanks, despite being a further increase on previous deployments, was not entirely new but the success of the attack and the resulting allied press enthusiasm, including in the United States, were unprecedented. The particular effectiveness of the tanks at Cambrai was the initial passage through barbed wire defenses, which had been previously supposed by the Germans to be impregnable. The initial British success showed that even the strongest trench defenses could be overcome by a surprise attack, using a combination of new methods and equipment, reflecting a general increase in the British capacity to combine infantry, artillery, tanks and aircraft in attacks. The German revival after the shock of the British attack improved German morale but the potential for similar attacks meant that the Germans had to divert resources to anti-tank defenses and weapons, an extra demand that the Germans could ill afford to meet. Wherever the ground offers suitable going for tanks, surprise attacks like this may be expected. That being the case, there can be no more mention, therefore, of quiet fronts. The German counter-attack showed the effectiveness of artillery, trench mortars and evolving stormtrooper tactics, adopted from a pattern introduced by General Houthier against the Russians. From the German perspective, questions arose regarding battlefield supply beyond railheads and the suitability of the MG-08 machine gun for rapid movement. By the end of the battle, the British retained some of the ground captured in the north and the Germans a smaller amount taken in the south. The British conducted several investigations, including a court of inquiry. Chapter 3 Section 2 – Casualties According to the statistics of the military effort of the British Empire during the Great War, British forces in the period of the Battle of Cambrai suffered 75,681 casualties, 10,042 killed or died of wounds, 48,702 wounded and 16,987 missing or prisoners of war. 
nearly 180 tanks were destroyed. According to the German Army Medical Report in the World War 1914 to 1918, German forces suffered 54,720 casualties at Cambrai, 8,817 killed and died of wounds, 22,931 wounded, and 22,972 missing and prisoners of war. The British recorded casualties on the basis of a daily head count and the Germans counted the number of patients in hospital every 10 days, which emitted lightly wounded, expected to return to service in a few days, not evacuated from the core area. Chapter 4, Memorials and Cemeteries The Battle of Cambrai, is commemorated annually by the Royal Tank Regiment on Cambrai Day, a major event in the regiment's calendar. The contributions of the Newfoundland Regiment at the 1917 Battle of Cambrai are remembered in the village of Masnias at the Masnias Newfoundland Memorial. Cambrai Day is also celebrated by Second Lancers of the Indian Army on 1 December every year as Lance Darfedar Gobin Singh of that unit was awarded the Victoria Cross during this battle. The name Cambrai was chosen in 1917 as the new name for the South Australian town of Rhinevilla, one of many Australian place names changed from German names during the First World War. During the remilitarization of the Rhineland in the late 1930s, Germany named a newly built Caserne in Darmstadt after the battle, which was later merged with the nearby Freier von Fritsch Caserne to become Cambrai Fritsch Caserne. The United States Army occupied Cambrai Fritsch Caserne, from the end of World War II until 2008, when the land was returned to the German government. Chapter 4 Section 1 – British Burial Sites The Commonwealth War Graves Commission has four memorials with the names or remains of 9,100 Commonwealth servicemen dead during the Battle of Cambrai. Cambrai Memorial to the Missing the monument lists 7,048 missing soldiers of the United Kingdom and South Africa who died and have no known graves. Fesquiers Hill British Cemetery, 900 servicemen were buried, one-third unidentified. Arrival Wood Cemetery, 200 servicemen buried. Hermes Hill British Cemetery, 1,000 servicemen buried. Chapter 4 Section 2, German Burial Sites the German War Cemetery on the route to Solemn was established before the offensive in May 1917, currently it accommodates the remains of 10,685 German, and 501 British soldiers.